Good morning, and welcome to the Sunday worship service of the First Unitarian Church of Salt Lake City. Welcome to each one of you gathered together from all over the place at one community of care. A couple of weeks ago, we had an unusual worship service where I invited everyone to attend church in their pajamas. It was a lot of fun, and I thought, oh, we should do this again. But I was thinking next Christmas, not two weeks from then. <laughs> well, here we are doing church in our pajamas again. Well, some of us anyway. I'm just grateful that you're all here however you come. If you're joining us for the first time today, a special welcome to you. I want to invite you to keep coming. When we reopen again, and we will, please visit our website, slcuu.org, to get a ticket for in-person worship. The tickets just help us to limit seating and create a list for contact tracing should it become necessary. In the meantime, please know that you are our honored guest and nothing would make us happier than to meet you in person. I have one announcement as we get started today. Very soon, we will begin our annual pledge campaign. Now, as you know, Unitarian Universalist churches are independently governed, and so almost 100% of our funding comes from our members and friends. So every year, we ask all you generous folks to make a pledge, a financial commitment to our church that supports our staff, our building, and most importantly, our mission in the world. This year, the timeline is going to look a little bit different than in previous years. We'll be kicking off the campaign in just a few weeks, and our celebration Sunday on March 20th will be the end of the campaign and a true celebration of the support that you've shown to our church. To be even more clear, and this is the part where you get your assignment, so listen really closely. We're hoping to have all the pledges in by March 20th so that we can go on planning the church budget for next year, knowing how much money we have to work with. Makes sense, right? So I'm asking you today to start thinking about two things. First, how much do I want to give in the coming year? How much do I believe in the mission of this congregation, in the people who make up this community, and what we can achieve together? And second, what kinds of things would I like to see the congregation do, and how much money will that cost? Many of you are now participate, participating in Teams Night, thank you, and starting to dream about what you'd like to accomplish as part of your team. So the staff would like to hear from you about budget priorities, and we're planning to invite you to share your ideas for our annual budget. But first, we have to raise the money, right? So start thinking about your own financial commitments to our church, your obligation of membership here, and how you plan to answer the call. And thank you in advance. On that note, after we hear from Amanda Esco, our Director of Religious Education, during our service today, we will hear a message from our Board of Trustees President, Sarang Joshi, about why he gives to our church. I hope it will inspire your giving today and throughout our pledge campaign. And now, let us quiet our minds, prepare ourselves for the task at hand, it's wonderful to be able to watch worship on Zoom, to make this small sacrifice to create a little more safety for our neighbors and our community. And yet, it can feel a little bit like watching TV. It's just that little bit harder to feel that we're participating in something sacred and profound. The joining together of a community to practice what it means to be Unitarian Universalists. So I invite you to be intentional about this time. Breathing in together. Breathing out. 
imagining your community gathered wherever they physically are right now. Imagining the ways in which we are taking care of each other by staying connected and observing our rituals of community. Let us light our chalice today with these words by the legendary Unitarian minister A. Powell Davies. Let me tell you why I come to church. I come to church and would, whether I was a preacher or not, because I fall below my own standards and need to be constantly brought back to them. I'm afraid of becoming selfish and indulgent and my church, my church of the free spirit, brings me back to what I want to be. I could easily despair, doubt and dismay could overwhelm me. My church renews my courage and my hope. It is not enough that I should think about the world and its problems at the level of a newspaper report or a magazine discussion. It could too soon become too low a level. I must have my conscience sharpened, sharpened until it goads me to the most thorough and responsible thinking of which I am capable. I must feel again the love I owe to others. I must not only hear about it, but feel it. In church, I do. I am brought toward my best in every way toward my best. is a tricky topic right now. <laughs> Author Kate Baller says, hope can feel like a kind of poison. Hope can feel like something that makes us painfully talk about a future that we don't think is going to be ours. I've come to feel that we all need hope, but we can't get it confused with optimism being certain about tomorrow, or just finding a new way to be confident in ourselves. Hope lets us believe in our not enoughness, that there might not be enough right now, 
but that there is a beautiful tomorrow. That is, a, there is a vision of what the future, through God and other people's love, is pulling us towards. This is where Unitarian Universalism diverges from progressive Christian thought in regards to hope. As Unitarian Universalists, we cannot hang our hope alone on the divinity of the universe. The beautiful vision is not enough. We are called to act. Hope is simply not enough. Our hope for our future is tied to how we respond today. Our Unitarian Universalism calls us to action. We cannot wait for divine intervention to change what needs to be changed. We are the ones who need to act on our hope. Humanist minister John Dietrich said, our responsibility is to put beauty in place of ugliness, good in place of evil, laughter in place of tears, to dispel error with knowledge, hatred with love, displace strife and contention with peace and cooperation. Our faith, our hope calls us to be agents of this change. In lower school religious education this year, we have new chalice lighting words. Forgive me if I've talked about this already, but they bear repeating. It goes like this. We light this chalice for, and then we pause and wait for an intention, a hope. And then we say, in the spirit of, and we place an action to that hope. Our hopes in one hand and our action in another. The chalice lighting ends with these words. We gather together in community to learn, to grow, and to serve. Which leads me to this week and our move back online. Once again, we have been called into action. We cannot gather safely together, so we stay home. We don't gather to in this person in, we don't gather in person in this moment because we do have hope for the future. So we act to keep ourselves and those we love in this community safe. It is the reason we have been so very cautious throughout this pandemic. Besides our belief in science, our hope for the future together calls us to act with caution. As lovely as a Bravenel Hall is, while they don't necessarily want this, they don't care if you and yours gets ill. It's a business. We are a church. Our walls do not stay here. The walls of our church are everywhere. Our church is not this building. This is a very nice address with a beautiful building where we are lucky enough to sometimes gather in person. Our church though, our church is within us all. Everywhere we go is church. We know that our prudent actions now allow us to hope for our future together, outside, inside, and over Zoom. Our hope is tied to our actions. May it be so. Thank you, Amanda, for that wonderful <coughs> reflection and hope. Uh, uh, before I give my testimony, let me tell you how I stumbled into becoming a member of the First Unitarian Church. My wife is from Switzerland and was brought up in the Christian Calvinist tradition. I was born in India and brought up in the Hindu tradition. As our kids were growing up, my wife believed that we needed to be part of a faith community. I went along and we started church shopping. The concept of belonging to a church was rather foreign to me 
as in India, we have a plethora of temple, temples dedicated to various different products. One visited different temples based on the auspicious days or different festival one happens to celebrate. When we visited traditional Christian churches around town, I could never see myself accepting heaven and hell, or for that matter, the fundamental concept of Jesus as our one savior. When we visited the first church, we heard Tom giving a sermon on Mark Twain's letters from Earth. I was immediately intrigued. I was truly pleased when Tom followed it with a sermon that began with the origin story of Lord Ganesha, the elephant-headed god. When Christmas came along, I was dreading the traditional nativity pageant, and to my astonishment, the pageant at the first church told the story of Confucius, Buddha, and Jesus, highlighting the parallels. Here was a church I could belong to. Although we signed the book and Karan started volunteering as an RE teacher, I was rather passive and did not really give to the church. I left that to Karan. This all changed a little over three years ago, when as a sanctuary church, we gave sanctuary to a Honduran woman and her two daughters. I had the privilege of being part of the sanctuary steering committee and witnessed the church community coming together and living the UU principles. That is when I truly started giving to the church, not just financially, but with my heart. Being an immigrant myself, the church gave me the answer to the question, what did you do during the Trump years when the US, US turned against immigrants and disowned, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, earning to breathe free. It is easy to proclaim principle one believes in, but quite difficult to actually live by them. As we go through our transition period and reflect on who we want to become in the future, I hope we continue to be a welcoming community for people of all faiths, may they be atheist, Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, or Christian, and keep our focus on helping one another to live an authentic life centered around our eight principles. Thank you. to begin today with this new poem by Amanda Gorman, A New Day's Lyric. May this be the day we come together. Morning, we come to mend. Withered, we come to weather. Torn, we come to tend. Battered, we come to better. Tethered by this year of yearning, we are learning that though we weren't ready for this, we have been readied by it. We steadily vow that no matter how we are weighed down, we must always pave a way forward. This hope is our door, our portal. Even if we never get back to normal, someday we can venture beyond it to leave the known and take the first steps. So let us not return to what was normal, but reach toward what is next. What was cursed, we will cure. What was plagued, we will prove pure. Where we tend to argue, we will try to agree. Those fortunes we foreswore, now the future we foresee. Where we weren't aware, we're now awake. Those moments we missed are now the moments we make, the moments we meet. And our hearts, once altogether beaten, now altogether beat. Come, look up with kindness yet, for even solace can be sourced from sorrow. We remember, not just for the sake of yesterday, but to take on tomorrow. 
We heed this old spirit in the new day's lyric. In our hearts we hear it. For auld lang syne, my dear, for auld lang syne. Be bold, sang time this year. Be bold, sang time. For when you honor yesterday, tomorrow you will find. Know what we fought need not be forgot nor for none. It defines us binds us as one, come over, join this day just begun, for wherever we come together, we will forever overcome. I love the beginning of a new year. I love making resolutions and setting intentions. I'll admit it, I love self-improvement and trying to make my life just a little bit happier and more satisfying. There's nothing that special about New Year's except we treat it like a new beginning. And that's what makes it a new beginning. And I love new beginnings and I love beginners and I love people who make it their intention to always be beginners. I love waking up early on New Year's Day, brewing a cup of coffee, and sitting very still to listen to what the universe wants to say to me, where God is pointing me next, what important work lies inside of me and ahead of me. I like to lay out my tarot cards and divine what the year has in store for me. And I love hearing from the witchy folks in our congregation about your readings too. And I love to hear your New Year's resolutions and provide support or accountability if I can. Not everyone loves New Year's resolutions and that's okay. We all try to live better in our own ways or perhaps what's really important for you right now is accepting and loving yourself just the way you are. But this year, it does feel different. You wouldn't be blamed if you couldn't tell much difference between January 2021 and January 2022, or January 2020 for that matter. All the years, all the Januaries seem to be blending into one another and nobody really knows what year it is anymore. What is time? What is, is time real? Or are we now living in some kind of alternate universe where time doesn't exist? Or maybe we're stuck in a time trap like that movie Groundhog Day the same unbelievably boring stories <laughs> repeating over and over. Trying to make New Year's resolutions under these conditions feels a little absurd. <laughs> Not to mention, we're living through one of those eras in American history that feels like history is being made every day. Sometimes I wonder how many revolutions we're living through simultaneously. Definitely a technological revolution with not just people, but things globally networked, the increasingly muscular surveillance state and artificial intelligence developing at breakneck speed. A medical revolution in which vaccines to counter deadly viruses are ready for market within months rather than years. And at the same time, trust in the medical establishment lower and medical services less accessible than they have been in decades. An economic revolution in which mega billionaires have hoarded enough wealth to operate as small dictatorial nations. And yet workers are also staging a great resignation, demanding better wages and treatment by simply refusing to go to work. And there are others too climate revolution, a government revolution. It's an overwhelming time to be alive. The question of what sort of better life we might live, that question that crosses our mind around the new year, whether we believe in making resolutions or not, is now heavy with meaning. Common resolutions like drinking more water, 
seem like such a small gesture of self-improvement when every trip to the store is a gamble. When you've been stuck at home with your family for months, maybe a better life looks like five minutes to yourself. When you've been alone for months, maybe a better life looks like running ordinary errands just to be around other people. One thing is for sure, what we think of as a better life is not the same as it was two years ago. Tethered by this year of yearning, we are learning that though we weren't ready for this, we, are, we have been readied by it. Here we are again, me, preaching to a tiny red light in the balcony instead of your beautiful masked faces in these pews. Well, there are a few. <laughs> but it doesn't feel as disappointing to me today. All week since we made the announcement that we're going back online for a few weeks, we've been hearing from you that you support the decision. You sound a little resigned, like, oh, here we go again. But that actually feels like progress to me. It indicates to me that rather than letting this Omicron wave become a huge wave of disappointment that crashes over you, you're learning to surf. We are now starting to trust that there will be life on the other side of this, some kind of life. As Gorman says, instead of returning to what is normal, you are reaching toward what is next. Somewhere in our minds, we knew that pandemics aren't over in a year. We know that great movements of history take time, and we won't know where they're going until long after we arrive. Though we can't yet picture the life that is waiting for us, we can feel ourselves changing in response to this great movement. How have we changed? How have you changed? We have learned to be satisfied with less. We have learned to keep our own company. We have learned to reach out to a neighbor to comfort and to be comforted. We have learned to appreciate the company of strangers as well. We have learned to seek shelter in routine, in craft, in discipline. We have learned to take seriously, maybe for the first time, the voice that says, this work isn't satisfying. I hate this commute. I'm worth more than I'm being paid. We've learned to hang out outside again, even if the weather isn't perfect. We've learned just how much risk we're willing to accommodate. And many of us have also learned to be patient and gentle with others whose risk tolerance is higher than our own. And this extends beyond the virus itself. We've realized if we've been listening carefully about the risks others bear in living with racism, with disability, with isolation, without health insurance, without papers, without family. Just getting by is fraught with risks for so many people, and many of us are realizing just how privileged we are to be able to stand, to shield ourselves from all that risk behind our skin color, or our investments, or our connections. Every handshake, Every hug, every trip puts us in intimate contact with risk and gives us a taste of the risks that others take every day just to survive. For what have we been readied? Where is all this risk assessment taking us? Gorman says, this hope is our door our portal, even if we never get back to normal, someday we can venture beyond it, to leave the known, 
and take the first steps. Maybe we are being ready to finally venture beyond normal. Maybe all this is preparing us to pass through this portal because we understand more fully that every door, every portal requires risk. And now we know how much risk we can take or maybe we know how to know how much risk we can take. And we know how to travel with those who can handle more or less, maybe knowing that something is on the other side gives us courage to take those first steps. The Buddhist teacher Tara Brach says that perhaps the biggest tragedy in our lives is that freedom is possible, yet we can pass our years trapped in the same old patterns. We may want to love other people without holding back, to feel authentic, to breathe in the beauty around us, to dance and sing. Yet each day we listen to inner voices that keep our life small. Is this portal of hope to which Gorman is taking us, leading us to that place where we can let go of normal, the more, which wasn't working out for us that well anyway, right? And start to embrace that larger, more authentic life we hadn't dared imagine was possible for us, for us as individuals and for us as a nation, as a people among a species. Narrow is the way that leads to the world we dream about and some things will be, have to be left behind. If we want to be free from climate change, we will have to leave behind traveling anywhere we want as fast as we want. And we have to let go of eating meat at every meal or maybe even any meals. And we have to let go of having everything we want right now. If we want to be free from racism, we have to leave behind every benefit that comes with being white or being close to whiteness. If we want to lead more genuine, more thoughtful, more connected lives, we will have to leave behind the safety of remaining buttoned up and invulnerable. We will not get through to the new world without leaving behind the baggage that is weighing us down and holding us back. And maybe, maybe this crisis is the portal that prepares us for crises yet to come. Could this be? Could one revolution set off another and then another? I heard this week that there are some in Utah's Republican legislature, Republicans now, who want to take steps to save the Great Salt Lake. I heard that there are coral reefs long thought dead that are now bursting with new polyps. I heard that Stacey Abrams is running for governor of Georgia again. I heard that change is waiting for us on the other side of that door, even if we never get back to normal. Shifting to a new normal means surrendering the hope that you're holding on to, which might feel in the short term like giving up all hope, but it's not. It's not. It's giving up the hope that isn't serving you anymore. And leaping out into what feels like nothing and letting a new hope catch you. Where we weren't aware, we're now awake. These moments we missed are now the moments we make, the moments we meet. What moments are we making? What moment are we meeting? I don't know yet. But I'm working on cultivating the qualities that will ready me to meet the moment when it comes. I want to be a better listener, especially to those who are different from me. I want to be more generous, not only with my belongings, but also with my intentions and my time. I want to have more fun and enjoy the life that I have without waiting around to see who's going to have fun with me. I want to touch the earth more and make time to feel the sunshine on my face. 
What is it that you want? Who do you want to be? Right now, and as you pass through this portal of hope, what are you willing to leave behind? What risks are you willing to accept? What hope are you prepared to leap into? Know what we've fought need not be forgot nor for none. It defines us, binds us as one. Come over, join this day just begun. For wherever we come together, we will forever overcome. Amen. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, but we know within, and we will get there, heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. We are going, heaven knows where we are going, but we know within, and we will get there, heaven knows how we will get there, but we know we will. Friends, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks also to our musicians, Nikki Blackburn Fuller, to Paul and Jane Gandy, and of course to David. Thank you so much for your gifts. We will continue to gather for Sunday worship virtually for at least the next two weeks, during which we'll keep an eye on the local and national conditions and reassess whether it's safe to gather once again in person. So please keep an eye on our website and our weekly torch email for updates. And thank you for your commitment to safety and community care, not just for us, but for Salt Lake City and our Blue Boat home. Today we close our service with these words by Rolla May. Joy is the experience of possibility, the consciousness of one's freedom as one confronts one's destiny. In this sense, despair can lead to joy. After despair, the only thing left is possibility. <laughs>